What we found was something that is uh, an everyday occurrence nearly in a lot of houses where an electric stove is used for cooking. And then inadvertently the housewife, whoever's doing the cooking, leaves the pan on the burner and all of a sudden it melts, flames up, and the house is gone. This is about the ninth occurrence that I've had in the last three years on investigation and finding this. We have some pictures that were made at the fire. The top picture here will show the stove in place with the melted down pot over the burner. The second picture is from a distance which shows the intense heat of the fire as it's generated. This is actually the center of the fire in this picture. And all fire for the entire area led from this one area. So we, we feel that without a doubt, and it's been verified by all these outside people who the insurance companies have hired to come in here, that the fire actually started in this location. It was not said, it was not arson. While attorneys ponder Dallas's new school busing plan, 7,000 Dallas school children are sitting at home this evening wondering about that plan. It calls for 84 city buses to carry the children to different schools. Parents are still puzzling over a complicated pickup and delivery system and are keeping phones busy at the school system's desegregation information center. Most are worried that pickup at elementary schools means their grade school kids are going to be bused. This is not the case. The schools are opening at different times this year, and parents need to call local principals for that information. Those principals, by the way, have authority this year for the first time over dress and grooming codes. They can veto styles they think are disruptive. A different kind of disruption is on the minds of Dallas police. Police have manned their own information center, and they've beefed up the force for tomorrow just in case. They say they're not expecting trouble, but they want to be ready if anything happens. Anti-busing groups say nothing will. Meanwhile, 7,000 school children are sitting at home, wondering. This is Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the move. Last year, the Texas Aggies had a disastrous season. They were 2-9, and nine, winning their first two games, losing their final nine, and they were 0-7 in Southwest Conference competition. The pressure is on head coach Gene Stallings. He has a lot of returning lettermen, but he still has some problems. He talks first about his offense. Well, uh, Jerry, we've got to, uh, got to make a lot of strides in that particular phase of our game. Uh, last year, I felt like we protected the passer very poorly, and uh, we blocked uh, the running game very poorly. Uh, the number one objective this spring and also the early fall was to improve our offensive line, which I think we've done. We have a couple of players that uh, that we really need that are injured right now. Ralph Saker really needs to work at right tackle, and Butch Camp really needs to work at left guard. Neither one of them are able to take part because of some little freakish injuries in practice. Uh, if we had them well, along with the people that are backing them up, I think our offensive line will be all right, and that's the key to your offense. Uh, quarterback uh, naturally uh, determines whether or not you move the ball uh, consistently or not. Lex James, who had hepatitis last spring, uh, jammed his thumb. How are you feeling physically? Uh, real well. I had a little bout with he hepatitis last spring, and uh, I've recuperated it uh, from that totally. Uh, I feel real good. Are there any changes in the offense for the season? Uh, it's a more simplified offense than last year. Uh, I thought I'd be a lot further behind with missing spring training last year, but uh, I'm glad to see that I'm not. With Green and Tremere on your heels, do you think this will make you a better quarterback? Right, we've got some fine sophomore quarterbacks coming up. Mark Green, 6'3", 220, and Tim Tremere, he's about 6'4", 200. Uh, fine set of quarterbacks. They impressed me a lot. They've uh, made me think a lot harder, uh, work a lot harder than I have been. Uh, and also with Joe Mack, he played uh, second string last year. And he's a real fine quarterback, got a fine release, quick arm. And uh, they put a lot of pressure on him. How do you feel about Homer May as a tight end? Well, he's a super player. Yeah, Homer May has gotten everything you want. He's got size, he catches, he blocks. He's one of the first ones out to practice. And he'd be very fortunate to have two or three of those. 
I just hope I can better the year I had last year. That's all I can say right now. In what areas have you worked on improving yourself at tight end? Probably the biggest area I've really worked on most has been uh, pass receiving. I mean, uh, blocking. My pass receiving was good last year, but my blocking was just bad at the start of the year. And I've probably worked more on blocking than anything else uh, since spring, last year and spring too. And your defense, please. Jerry uh, should be improved. Uh, we weren't good defensively last year at all. Uh, Boyce Best, for example, just had an outstanding early fall practice. The secondary is breaking for the ball better. I moved Brad Dusick to free safety from pullback. Um, if we had Dennis Caruth for Dallas Boy incident, who broke his leg last spring, real quality player, he hadn't been able to practice yet, and, and you need those kind of people. The Aggies play a couple of tough intersectional opponents this year. They meet LSU, and they also play Nebraska, ranked number one in many preseason polls. So they'll have their work cut out for them in their intersectional schedule. And once again, they face a tough conference lineup. This is Jerry Haynes for Channel 8 Sports.